All right. So yeah, it was my second time coming, and last time, I don't know how we got on it. Oh, I think we're talking about JQ or I don't know. And I was like, oh, I have replaced a lot of the tools that I use with Rust written replacements. <clears throat> um, prime example is Exa. Right here, let's make this bigger. There we go. Um, with, with, yeah, regular like GNU core utilities with Rust equivalents that are more modern. And so they're like, well, why don't we do a presentation on it? So here we are. Um, so yeah, I have a list of like 20 something things. And if I was kind of planning on just going to each of their <coughs> readmes on the repository, um, doing like a pros and cons of them and then a little demo and we can skip the ones that all everybody's heard of so that we don't, you know, duplicate things. Um, but yeah, and then these are the, just the descriptions. I was going to make this cool slideshow and then figure it would basically just be a copy of their readme. And so I said, why not do an interactive version? Um, so the first one, these are just alphabetic order. Um, Alacrity is a terminal emulator. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's really fast and I would replace it with, I use iTerm every day. I would replace it, but they don't have um, windowing support. So you can only ever have one window open, oh, okay. which is like super that's lame. Yeah, that's a bit of a But it is really fast and it's cool. They're like config is just like, I think it's YAML, it might be Tomlin now. And they can just uh, full screen it and use uh, Tmux. Yeah, so, <laughs> you can do that. and then I was, they, that's what they say to do, but my, I have a very love hate relationship with Tmux because yeah. copy and pasting is annoying. And it's, yeah. So anything, I at least like to have the option of tabs or windows or something. So can you not run multiple instances of it on Mac? You can, um, but then <laughs> then your task switcher winds up just being a whole bunch of alacrity windows. <laughs> and so, it, yeah, it just is not, I would say it's like 80% there. I'm, I, yes, yeah, so something you will learn, this is actually just my dot .files repository. Um, I am very particular about my stuff. I like to have my castle all set up and so I figured, yeah, I'm very picky. <laughs> so, this is Alacrity. There isn't much other than it's a terminal emulator. <laughs> and it's really fast. Um, I think it's one of the first, um, besides RipGrip, I would say it's one of the biggest like Rust applications like end user applications, um, has close to 20,000 stars. Um, yeah, there's not much other to say about that. Is it uh, cross-platform? Yeah, so I don't, yeah, it has Windows. Oh, it works in Windows. Yeah. I had it on Windows for a little bit. Oh, well, that, that that's, that's a... I, I will have to say a caveat to everything I'm about to say I never use Windows, like ever. So I have no idea how many of these apps support Windows. As far as I know, they all support Linux and Mac. Alacrity uh, did not like Vim when I tried it on Windows. Yeah, and it had a, a similar, oh, really? really bad bug. They actually have it on the README that's Mac OS Tmux plus Alacrity. There's some something or other. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I thought this was the fastest terminal emulator in existence, but just be aware if you use Tmux Vim and Alacrity, you might have to do something special. I don't know what it is. But yeah, that's what I did. What it, what it is. is that apparently not Alacrity's fault? No, it's not. It's some, I think it's actually Vim and Tmux's fault combined. They're not working on it? Yeah. Maybe it could be NeoVim. Yeah, NeoVim <laughs> is, that's what I use. I use VS Code and NeoVim both. Yeah, I tried it out a long time ago. And it's cool, but 
it was missing the like, feature that feature. Uh, it's I yeah. A long time ago, it was very feature incomplete. So I'm glad that it's. I as far as from my experience with it, the thing that was really only missing was the win windowing support. Like it has copy and paste and scrolling and stuff like that that it didn't have a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. And it didn't have scrolling. Yeah, scroll it scrolling. I tried it once without scrolling and I was like, nah, not gonna happen. I need this. The um another caveat, most of these Except so some so these are my get, uh, my dot files. The ones with asterisks are ones that are not like my scripts don't install them, and so those ones I aren't my daily drivers. But the rest of them I use pretty much every day, um, especially rip grip. So oh, rip yeah. grip you probably all heard of. So I don't know if we need to go into it. Of course we do. Okay, we'll go into it. We'll go into it. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Rip grep, um, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, Burnt Sushi. I like everything. Yeah, he, uh, he, he does a lot of Rust stuff. Um, I recently submitted like a bug and he was really cool. And I was like, whoa, Rip Burnt Sushi, I, I, I he's famous. I got to talk to him. Um, but it ended up being for a different project, but he was cool about it. Anyway, Rip grep is basically like grep or the Silver Searcher, except way faster and way easier to use. Um, it has since replaced in VS Code and Atom the Fuzzy Finder that uses RipGrep under the hood. And if you haven't read his blog post, I want to see if I can find a link. <laughs> it's like way long. It's, it's like the, 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 here it is right here. It's like the coolest blog post I've ever read. And it's about like, an extremely thorough uh, deep dive into why rip grep is faster than everything else in existence. And why if you try to search <clears throat> commands and yes, it might be a little slower, but here's why and why it doesn't matter or why that's not a fair comparison. Yeah, and like, and when I say thorough, he, he like, he, he must have spent months on this. And it's one of the best blog posts I've ever read. And the TLDR of it was that rip grep is the best and you should use it. But from an unbiased, I mean, he wrote it, but I would say a fairly unbiased look into it. So here's some examples. What I like about RipGrep is that it out of the box ignores anything in your git ignore recursively. So if you search like your home directory and you have a whole bunch of git directories, subdirectories of that, it'll go through and troll the git ignores and ignore stuff. He actually said that one of the, the slowest parts of rip grep was parsing the git ignores and figuring out what regex and stuff to use based on the git ignore. Um, but it's a really handy feature. And then um, also out of the box, it ignores hidden files. So you do have to tell it to look at hidden files. I like it because if you use grep and in a directory, it takes forever, like forever, ever. But with rip grep, I'm like, I don't even care. I run it on for some random string, looks through an entire node modules directory <laughs> really, really fast, and I don't have to worry about it. Sometimes I think I'm like, oh, I must have done the search wrong because it was too, like, it, that just came back in like a quarter of a second. And you yeah. had to go through a huge file. Like, no, it actually did go through searching all these files in a quarter of a second. Oh, and it supports Unicode. And Unicode traditionally makes things really slow, um, but it still is really fast and very correct. That was a big thing. Um, he knocks on some of the other ones for not being correct. Um, but yeah, he, he the, like I said, that blog post has some really cool like uh, libc like internal stuff and it's just really cool. Um, I guess I should pause here. Should Would you rather do a breadth first search or a depth first search of these things? Would you rather like do demos and stuff like that or go through them all and then come back and do demos if we have time? Well, I, I just want to know what's the most useful. And I, I think we should do a breadth first search. I don't think a breadth search. Yeah, maybe a breadth, breadth and then we'll choose which one we think okay. is the that, That's what I think we want. Go back and demo. Yeah, we, yeah. we do go hunting through Google. 
Yeah, I, I figured you guys could figure out how to use these uh, tools. Um, so that's Rip Grab. I would say it's kind of the star of the show. I use that and a couple others every day. Um, this one I actually recently found like probably a month, uh, a couple months ago. Um, it's not quite a daily driver for me just because it's not installed on all my machines, but I think I added it to my script so then it would be. But basically this whole thing, SD is a search and displace. It's basically said, but 21st century and it uses Python and JavaScript regex syntax. And so you don't have to do weird said stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah. I use, I, the other reason why I haven't is because I use Vim a lot. I kind of am fairly familiar with said syntax, but sometimes they have an example right here of replace new lines with commas. And it's like, this is straight up black magic. I have <laughs> no idea what that does. This and this, it doesn't deal well with new, like new lines are delivered into lines. You can't do stuff with them. Yeah, because it's the, the line, line oriented. Line oriented. Yeah. And oh, yeah, cool. so this is like the bread and butter example of you know, why you should use SD. Also, it's faster to type in the command line by one character. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. Is, is, your, is your list online? I was just yeah. That. So. I was going to make it a separate list and then figure like most of these were in my dot files and I should add this feature list anyway. But yeah, it's uh, Emily Myers slash dot files, github.com slash. Oh, that's really small. So BD dubs, is this brew install SD? Is that? Yeah. So a lot of. Because some of them, like RipGrep, in some places you have to install it as RipGrep. In other places you install RG. Oh, yeah. And my dot files handle that. And uh, honestly, if that could be one, one, my one wish for computing would be everybody uses the same package manager syntax and everybody uses the same package name. <coughs> um, most of these can be installed with cargo install. Um, SD, you can't actually install brew with homebrew. So that's a cargo install. Cargo install SD. Are you sure about that? Because I just did brew install SD and it seems to be working. Uh, then I have to change my dot files. Thank you for... Yeah, it is. And it's also not on there. Uh, huh? Yeah, I already have an SD install. <laughs> um, maybe I'll alien SD to set. <laughs> <laughs> that would be... Terrible if you had any install scripts that came from. <laughs> oh, there are aliens aren't using the script unless it's called. No, oh, okay. no, I think they are. That's not why you. Have, that's why you have to use. Uh, maybe in French. Right. Functions are, but not aliens. Uh, unless you say you can use aliens. Um. So this this one, the next one, um, I actually just found yesterday when I was researching this, but I thought it was pretty cool. It wasn't quite so. The motivation of this is. It's, it's like watch, like just regular watch, but also has this config file. And I'm it's semi unclear if you have to use the config. So this would be really cool for projects to, to watch certain files. But if you wanna just like watch the output of a command or something, I don't think you have to use a config, like for example, this. So if any of these files change, then run this command. So I don't, have you guys, so something else on my list is cargo watch. I have a couple of cargo subcommands because I thought that might interest everybody. And cargo watch is on my must have. I use it for all my projects. Well, every, my biggest project that I'm working on is a server and it's really handy to reload the server when, when, I added a file. And this that the funzy is pretty similar. Um, this next one, Delta, is pretty slick. I think they have so they have a light uh, a light version of the thing, but basically it is a better git diff and regular diff output. 
um, because it shows like within line changes and um, does you know whole blocks instead of just pluses or minuses on the left column. Um, and actually, uh, do you know it's like it's like recognizing like what function you're in? Is that so? It's just a rate. So this is a regular diff output, but just colorized with this program called Delta. And so it's not like recognizing what function, that's just what changed. So it looks like they added this parameter. So that little thing, box of the size is class slash function. Oh. Is it really recognized by Git? That's recognized by Git, yeah. It is? Oh, okay. Does Git only do that for like C functions or something? Or is it does that for no, it does all it languages? Really? Everything, yeah. I get that. It is not very well formatted in the default Git output. There is, let's see if I have a terminal window open. So an example of this on a dark background would be this. So this was actually adding this to the, to the um, readme that we're just reading. So all of this was added. So it's a big green chunk and then, you know, the red. So I, I like that a lot and it's just, you can install with most package managers and then you do have to add it to your git config if you want to use it as the default pager so basically when you do git show or diff or whatever and then you know obligatory feature matrix of why this is the best <laughs> Okay, so this one is interesting. I don't know if you guys have heard of Deno, but I thought I would give it a shout out. I've only used it once, and even then it was basically just download it, see if it was cool. But it's a more secure JavaScript runtime written in Rust. And this is written by the person that wrote Node. Correct, yeah. The first guy. Because I Ryan think, Dahl. yeah, he doesn't do yeah. Node anymore. So he, he started rewriting Node in Go, and it didn't work because of memory management and garbage collection conflict. And so then he started rewriting it in Rust. And it's TypeScript rather than JavaScript. I thought it did JavaScript and TypeScript. Well, TypeScript is, well, is a superset, right? Yeah. yeah, it's TypeScript first. Yeah, it's TypeScript first, which is, <coughs> TypeScript's just better than JavaScript. <laughs> But really, well, for neither. a typed language, yeah, doesn't, yeah, it's a diff, it's like that's like saying Rust is better than JavaScript, like it's not, yeah, yeah, like different. Yeah, like, I guess, anyway. I guess what I'm saying is types is better than dynamic type. How does that is good? <laughs> I, it's interesting though, I didn't know that he started in Go. Yep, that's cool. Um, so yeah, Deno is a cool, hot new kid on the block in the JavaScript world. So you use it for something practical or? No, I've only just downloaded it and messed around with it. My friend actually has, and he's trying to, he has a, I think he added it to, he has this project called Zwitterion, I think is what it's called. And it's like a, uh, it's kind of like Webpack, except it works for lots of different languages. <coughs> um, and it's really just focused on hot reloading. Um, and I think he added support for it for that. So he's kind of used it for something cool. And then, you know, the, their whole thing is it's secure because Rust and also just building it from the ground up. Um, F select. This one's cool. It hasn't made it into my daily driver toolbox, I guess you could say. Um, But it, it has a really cool idea that it's like find in LS, except you use SQL-like grammar. Um, so let's see if they have, so here's like their, their syntax, but this is an example. Huh. Um, so, 
I, I the thing that appealed to me from this was a that it was different and b that because you're already using SQL, perhaps for something, or you might know simple C SQL syntax, you can, you know, not have to reuse it. And it actually kind of maps pretty well with, you know, mm -hmm. a directory being a from statement. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's cool. I don't know why it hasn't made it into my daily driver. I think this is actually why. There's, I have another one, another find replacement called FD that I, it basically just like more powerful than find and also simpler at the same time. And faster. And, and way faster, yeah. And so I think that's why it hasn't made it in, into my <coughs> daily use, but. I feel like I don't, like if I did something like this a lot, I would use it, but like I don't usually need sure. to like script, like I don't need the like size and the yeah. whatever, right? Like usually it's just, I'm just giving you all the information, I'll look at it and be done. Yeah. If I was using it scripting a lot, maybe this is like cool. No, this, this looks really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's it's definitely worth a a gander. So I think it's it's a cool idea. And then I didn't know it could do even aggregate functions. Wow. You do like average size and stuff like that. That's cool. It seems a little like you wouldn't know what the reserved words are, like that it knows how to calculate size. Well, I think there's a list of like, you know, you're, you're, you've got six properties that are common for files. Yeah. And then some variation on it. So oh. it's probably like name, size, path. And then C, modified C like time, time yeah. And time. Basically whatever stat can give you. Yeah. Right. This is probably what it's doing. I think you can't like, <coughs> you don't have to worry too much about like keywords because there's only like, yeah, five you can or six. put that kind of stuff on the left side. You wouldn't be able to put anything else, right? Yeah, so. makes sense. Um, and then this one, I when I first found out about it, I immediately replaced ls. I actually aliased ls to exa um, because I was sick of managing colored output. <laughs> um, and it's also git aware. So yeah, this is like out of the box. You don't have to do anything. You just run exa and this is what it, what it prints out. And then it does, um, uh, tree structure and is Git aware so it knows when things have been modified. Doesn't look like it's showing that in the screenshot, but I can show you guys in my terminal if you care. Um, and it's also just simpler in terms of, uh, it's about the same, but it has new features. My big thing was that I just like the colors. <laughs> um, but it does have some cool extras like ign ignoring git ignore stuff. Um, directories first. I'm not sure if you can do that in LS. At least I never did. Where you put the directories on top, kind of like how a text editor would would do. And then you know it has a bunch of fancy or you know regular LS kind of stuff. Oh man, that is so hot! Isn't it cool? <laughs> I'm like a huge fan of having a really pretty setup, but I hate like managing it. Yeah. And so I had this like crazy long LS colors, colors like crazy long from this one GitHub repo. Um, and then I was like, wait, why don't I just use this? So then that's what I did. Um, it's the next one. LSD, despite being a really cool name, <laughs> um, XO one out. It's pretty much the same thing as LS. And to be honest, the reason why it won for me is I didn't want to have to install the font <laughs> thing to get the... If you like having icons in your terminal, you can go with LSD because by default, you use all these icons. But yes. if you have to install fonts, awesome. And to do it. if you don't want to do that. Yeah, and really it was like, 
I switch between Ubuntu and Arch Linux and home, uh, Mac with Homebrew. And I was like... <sighs> so it doesn't install fonts on its own? It's no. Really... It's different enough when I raised something about it. You have to use a you have to use a was it power line patch font? So if you already have a power line patch font, then it would just work. Then it would work. Then that one might be worth and yeah. actually, I recently found out I think iTerm has some power line for Mac users has some power line fonts built into it. I think it does. Yeah. So for me on my MacBook for work, it was really easy. I installed the OSB and it, yeah, I just switched my iTerm font and I'm like, oh look, pretty icons. And then on my Ubuntu machine on a home, I had to go and figure out how to add it, and it was a little more of an asshole. So. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know, I might switch to that. I do kind of like the simplicity of Exa, though. Because, like, Exa, you could put on pretty any machine, and it would probably do Yeah. So that's fine. Um, I, I feel like Exa, the development kind of stalled, <coughs> but it might have picked up again. I mean, I guess it's kind of like, what more can you add to an LS clone? <laughs> but... I guess it was this this summer. That's not too bad. So yeah, that's LSD. They do have that fun uh, um, name. Um, Bat. This is actually, I think, the thing that I mentioned last week, and this is the reason why we're doing this, was Bat. Uh, first of all, I think their tagline is the coolest tagline of any... <laughs> Project I've seen a cat clone with wheel or with wings, awesome. And a great icon too. Great icon, so it's automatically winning support. Um, but this is the output of the, of Bat on the terminal. So this is not with less or anything else. Has you know not line numbers, colors, the whole nine yards. I also made this step or the switch. I aliased cat to Bat because when you pipe bat, it recognizes it and just automatically does what cat would do anyway. And so I figured, why not? And so now every time I use cat, it's that. So I can show you, I feel like it's not quite as cool seeing a screenshot. Does it have a, a copy paste option? Um, to like copy it into your clipboard automatically? Well. Or, I, was, oh. I was just thinking so that like when you copy it and paste it. It doesn't have the line numbers and stuff? Yeah. Um, no, it has a, uh, well, yeah, I guess it does. It has a plane. Yeah, so you can do you can do this, <laughs> and it's no line numbers. And then no, if I copy paste that, it's going to work like it would normally. Okay. No, I wonder what it normally works. Yep. Um, it doesn't look like, oh, I think I alias to that, but. Yeah. There's there's what it would look like. I might have to change that. I kind of do like the line numbers by default. But yeah, that was just my alias. This is the default bat. And with, so this one, um, I'm really partial to this theme is called One Dark. It's from Adam and I use it in Vim, VS Code, everything. And by default, it doesn't use this syntax, but you can change it or this color scheme. And there's like a bazillion different color schemes and you change it through an environment variable. Um, and then uh, I don't know if I have any Rust files handy, but yeah, it colorizes, you know, it recognizes every language. So are, are there like <coughs> common libraries or something that, the, like why, for, why is Rust becoming so popular for CLI and why are all of the tools so pretty? Um, I, I actually have wondered that myself. I think one, they do have clap, um, and clap makes it really easy. I'd known about it for like a year, but just started using it in my project like a month ago. Clap makes it super easy. Also, it, I think it makes the, like all the help and like, these are arguments you can use this. Issue. Yeah. That stuff comes automatically. You can do like really sub commands, uh -huh. flags, required flags, flags that take arguments, the whole nine yards. And then it also does, I feel like Rust people are just really particular about their setup. They just like, they appreciate aesthetics. <laughs> um, but yeah, what you... so there's another thing about that that is really, really nice is that it just, if the file it's about to print is longer than your terminal, it automatically uh, types it into less. Yes. It's fantastic because you don't have to deal with like scrolling up a thousand lines. I did, I don't, yeah, I should have said that, but I don't know if you noticed right here. It autumn, I'm in less right now. 
Um, but yeah, and I feel there is a uh, Rust library. Let's see if we can look at it really quick. That does um, uh, parsing. So the ANSI color is what they're using, but I swear they were using, there's a library that like recognizes um, source code and colorizes. Oh, it's like, probably the Python library pigment, probably, right? I I think it's in, they, I think it's Rust. in Rust. Oh really? I'm pretty sure. Might be Content Inspector maybe. That sounds like it could be promising. But yeah, because this library and a couple other libraries, I think use some, you know, colorizer. So yeah, this the Bat and Exa are the two that like I replaced. Well, there's a couple more that I replaced the old school equivalent of and haven't had any second thoughts about doing that. Looks like maybe Syntex, was that one? Yes, one? Syntex, that's it. Syntex, yeah. That's what... Um, yeah, you, just, you can pull it up, there's a pretty good, like, sin, like it, you can just, like, use it as cat, and, like, it's not going to be as fancy as that, but, like, it'll, like, highlight it all. Yeah, this... So, there's another thing on my um, list called the Zy editor um, that I check up on like every couple of weeks because I really want to replace VS Code. <laughs> I, I love VS Code. It's just, I have this machine has 32 gigs of RAM and eight cores and it's still not fast enough for me. And it still uses so much battery. Um, but anyways, the Zy editor uses Syntax as their highlighter. So that is the library. Thanks for catching that. We need an electron clone in Rust. That's what we're I know, doing. and it needs to be like. And do you create six megabytes? Yes. Not six. <laughs> Not six gigabytes. Yeah. Um, and take. Electron that takes five megabytes. The fact that everything has a billion different modules. Yeah. Well, and. Well, but Chrome is bad. Chrome, Chrome, Chrome is bad, and is that's. Bad. Electron is basically Chrome, except if you have Chrome and Electron used, they can't load any of the shared libraries except for like C. It would be really nice if they could though. I know. And Chrome and Electron and, and all the other Yeah, things. but then all the security people would be like, ah. Um, but yeah, Syntec is really cool. Uh, a fair number of Rust projects use it. I think there's a, I have Toke, I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay. Not Tokyo. Tokyo okay is for counting lines. Counting lines, oh. Um, oh, which is, it is crazy fast. I used it on the Linux cool. kernel. It's fast. Mm -hmm. I downloaded the Linux kernel with like a 300 megabyte connection way slower than counting the lines. I, I don't understand. Is line counting slow in some? I mean, um, so I use the, WC and I've never so, been like, oh my God. So it's a, mean, no, it's a, it's, it's a source code line counter. So it parses it, ignores comments. Well, it shows you one with comments, without. Um, and I thought it was a simple problem. And then I looked at some of their test cases and it's like, what if you have a, a comment that like starts at the end of a line and then wraps over and it's, there's like a bunch of diabolical test cases. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it's a source source code counter because yeah, <coughs> WC is fast. Yeah, because that's that's just not a problem that I've ever had. So yeah. I don't know why. Solved the new problem that I didn't know I had. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, like for example, if I hadn't used riprap, I wouldn't have known that was a problem that I had. So I saw somebody else use it, and it was like, uh, well, I, the thing that hooked me was dot getting one. I know. It was like that's that's mm -hmm. that's all you had to say, and then all the other stuff is just like wow. It's awesome, and then it, and then the cherry on top is that it's like ten times faster. Um, but I, but I, who, who is ever, the only way that I've noticed that is because it's ignoring the node modules folder. By the yes. Way. Like that's, that's the only. <laughs> AKA the black hole. Yeah, that would have made it yeah, so. yeah. yeah. We could have just had grep skip that and then we'd be fine. Yeah. If we just had a new version of grep with the, the, that would respect <laughs> dot get ignore, then yeah, we wouldn't, I mean, but it's still, it's a nice tool, but, but I, I don't think it's like, oh. This, this parses a text file 10 times faster. It's like, well, darn, because like my eyes are so good. 
Yeah. Like, I'm so into nanoseconds. You won't notice it for small things, but if you go to a big directory, yeah. you accidentally search in a big directory, you will for sure. Yeah, Linux, yeah. It, it, it grab like, fails. Like, like, like two blinks rather than one? No, 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 no. No, like, 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 like half a second versus three minutes. Yeah. That kind of difference. Yeah, it's it's know. it's orders of magnitude. You will for sure believe it if you it's like a big project. <laughs> I'm gonna read the blog post, but it's it's orders of magnitude. Yeah. <coughs> you just need a big product to feel it. All. But but yes, the get ignore thing is the awesome thing. Oh, and yeah, I, I've done searches on my entire partition, like like yeah. slash like root folder. Yeah. And um, the other thing that I like about RipGrip is that it supports a sane regex. Out of the box, and you have to do like extended ref regex yeah, or, dash e and or whatever, or question which version of regex you need to use. Using egrep or pgrep. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so FD, that's the other one. I haven't aliased it to find because it's different enough, but this has, I never use find anymore. Granted, I just use fuzzy finder instead of find. But yeah. Okay, so FD is, okay, so how is, it, how is this one different? So FD, oh, it has a demo for you. Um, FD uh, does the normal like 21st century things, ignores git ignore, ignores hidden folders, uh, hidden files. Um, the Romans totally had so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, but, and then the other thing is it's just faster. I like it because it, the A, again, the regex is a same, like, I don't know, I say sane, but that's just because I started programming in the last eight years. Um, and so I don't have to know which uh, regex version I'm using. Um, and I don't, I, for the life of me, can never remember like all the like escaped parentheses. Slash semicolon. Slide, yeah, slash semicolon, slash plus, or this is just like dash X delete or you know rm or whatever you want to do with it um yeah that dash dash exact is just dash x okay um and then of course it's faster than find and hooray <laughs> so th what, does does this work without having to do like x arcs crap is that yeah so uh, it's like um find that you can do an exec but not have to remember to do a semicolon or a plus or know the difference between the two and oh and has colorized output hooray which is shown here if you a common theme of all these projects is i really like colorized output <laughs> and that's from clap um clap is a command is a parser for args oh okay i don't know what the library, what they use, I actually think it's just a custom thing on top of the, uh, it's a, I don't really, oh, on top of ANSI term and, oh, LS color is probably what they're using. By the way, the regex crate is like awesome. It's sick, very fast and very feature rich. So that's FD. Um, I have one, you were saying a fuzzy finder. I have two fuzzy finders on here. One I'll of them- your fuzzy finder and raise you. One of them's, <laughs> one of them's go, and the other one, it, which is the one I actually do use. There's two at the, at the very bottom that are not actually written in Rust that I thought deserve mentions. Skim is the one that's written in Rust, but all of my stuff was already configured to FCF and I didn't move over wait what, are, what does it do What's, yeah what i, I mean? <laughs> we'll we'll jump out of order and i'll do those right now so fcf um oh uh, not this it is oh it's not a live one let's do a live thing um <laughs> so this is my I just did control R. So first of all, I use fish, but it this works in bash and F fish and ZSH. Um, and instead of having, you know, the weird one line, like not really cool thing, this is a fuzzy finder. So I can do B E W and it does brew. It looks like I misspelled something. <laughs> um, 
cargo. These are all my cargo things. And then I can just, you know, do that. And that's just control R. I use it in Vim for finding files. You can pipe anything to, so you can just do like FD dot FCF. And now I have a fuzzy finder of the different files in this, in this directory. You can, so it's a shell. It's kind of a shell, but it's it's just a program that accepts input and you fuzzy find, all fuzzy find okay, cool. within it. Really cool. You can there's a yeah you can basically hook everything that has text in your finding something in the text. You just type it through SDF and it'll be great. It's you, crazy like, awesome. Like I use it for like get branches, get files, and then you can it has like a whole thing on like here's some great function to add to your get thing. So now I type like Control G, Control F, and now it's searching. All of the files that would show up if you didn't type git status. So like all the time you're like, oh, git status, okay, now I'm gonna commit just this file. Oh, now I just control G, control G, control F, and now I'm just like, oh, grab this one, and this one, and yeah. add them, or whatever, right? I need to I need to integrate it better with Git, but it's oh, yeah. integrated really well with like I have um, J, this thing that I type J and it these are all of my uh, can you directory make that bigger? bigger? I can't see it. I can't, I, I can't see what you're actually typing. Find it freaking out. There we go. Right? There we go. All right, let's let's. So yeah, I'm now just at my home directory, and I want to cd into my developer directory, and I can just go boom. Uh, so wait, what is J as an alias? I've I've alias J. There was some package. I don't know where. That used J, and I was like, okay, that's cool because it's right on the home row, right there. But yeah, it's just my alias, and all I, all it does, I think it's like CD. It takes the output of FCF and then just immediately CDs into that directory. It's also by uh, Alt C by default. Yeah, Alt C. I think yeah. No. Is that all yours? Or Alt C? Yeah. So there's like hotkeys for it too. I use J. Um, so. I'm so confused. So imagine, so I have like, I want to CD into my dot files directory. I could do the whole path, which this is fish. So it's cool and knows that I probably want to go to this directory. Yes. yes. But if I didn't know that I could just do J. Oh, actually it's a bad example because it's going to be, okay, now, <laughs> never mind. Now I have hidden and I can do dot files. And actually I could do like files. Whoa. So what exactly is J an alias for? It's an alias. So it's actually a function. Um, you, can it, see, you can type F and see what it is. For FZF? Uh-huh. Okay. For, well, for so it's, an, it's a function that, it, that, does, that runs FD and gets me all the directories or find, gets me all the directories in my current directory. Then it takes that, puts it into FCF, which fuzzy filters it, then it takes that and does CD to the output of the FCF. So how does it build the index? It's not an index. It's just live, like FD does the hard work of finding all the directories and it's fast enough to do that. I saw the directories and subdirectories of the FCF, which then fuzzes my file. Because, well, I've got like, I don't know about y'all, but I've got like 25 million files in my home folder, so I don't F know. FD is fast. <laughs> I watch it crunch. F, so this is F FD runs on the same stuff that. Uh, Sounds like you use the same. <laughs> yeah. I got, yeah. I, I, so yeah, you, you want to do type space F, and, and I think that'll tell us what the index is for. FD uses the same. Oh, file oh, oh, like oh that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uses under the hood, so it's. So this is. So this is annoying because then this is I have to do it on this. Ever, ever since they integrated uh, Spotlight with the internet, it doesn't work for actually searching the hard drive anymore. <laughs> I've turned off all the iCloud stuff, but it still takes forever to find files on the hard drive. So, so this is turned to the CLI. Oh yeah. Um, for everything. If you, if anyone uses Fish, I do have like a package that installs this for you, but it's mo it's pretty much what I just said with a little bit of workarounds like. It defaults it to using find with ignoring a whole bunch of like Linux um, file systems and crap. Gets rid of some binary, it looks like. I don't even know what that's doing. Um, but I have it just 
I have this fcfcd command to just fd, and I think that's fd-td, which just is directories. So yeah, that, that one, this one's a little more, fcf is by far the thing that requires the most setup. I mean, it doesn't require any setup because you can just pipe whatever you want, but if you want to take a full advantage of it, you can integrate it into NeoVim, Vim, you, you name it. FCF is a very, very um, versatile utility. And then there's Skim, which is more or less FCF, came out like a year later, but it's written in Rust and faster. And oh, so FCF is not Rust. It's Go. It's the one, there's Go and JQ, which are not Rust, and everything else in this list is I Rust. I freaking love FCF. The only place that I've had trouble with getting it to work on Windows in the MSYS2 environment, which is... Oh, the, is that the Linux place. subsystem? No, so it's actually what people used before WSL was actually usable. What was it? What's it called? MSYS2. MSYS, yeah. MSYS. Yeah. It's like a successor to the... The um, super. Well, not yeah. so that the super was more of an isolated environment. It was replacing for the um, main BW. Oh, uh, yeah. Which is what I used to use. Um, so, yeah. I've, it's, it's like an implementation of the, the parts of, of POSIX yeah. that you can yeah. native yeah. download. Yeah. 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 So, I've tried to write stuff that works in all of the different Windows shells, you know, like all six million of them with. <laughs> now you have bash, but then you have PowerShell, but you have command, and then you have, yeah. And there's different versions. I think you should just screw all of it and, and hope they have the Windows subsystem for Linux installed. Well, the, <laughs> the thing is, Windows paths and Linux paths use opposite slashes. And so if you're reading from an environment variable that's a Windows environment variable, which comes from the registry, then it will be... Slashes yes. without escapes because in the registry you don't need escapes. Cool, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough to know whether or not you're getting a path or no, AJ, a string. You don't sound bitter at all. Either. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm actually not bitter about it. It's just it's tough. It's just tough. Okay. I'm bitter. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's SK, basically same thing as FCF, but go. I mean, nice. rest. Yeah, a little while ago, I, I learned why, <coughs> holy shoot, the conventions are different for the paths. Why is it? It goes back to uh, like deck CPM. operating systems. <laughs> I don't know uh, what that is. DOS, so oh, digital, digital Equipment Corporation was like the See you screen sort of yeah. uh, so <laughs> Don't stop me now. So we're, oh, you know, we're all done. Mostly, before the world switched to Unix. Yeah, so uh, everybody, everybody was running uh, like GPUs or whatever for automation and stuff. Okay. Oh, it's not I stole it. And yeah, the, the operating systems that ran um, like PDP, the PDP-10 operating system, um, ITS, uh, that's like uh, Bill Gates used ITS as one of the, not ITS, it was, um, that was the MIT one. Anyway, the, uh, the, the official deck operating system for the PDP-10, this is a big time-sharing mainframe sort of thing, and he had access to it if you're long interested in looking at it. <laughs> Um, Sounds like sentimental yeah. reasons then. <laughs> well, it, it was just everybody copied the. the so Unix was a weird one. Five yeah, the so Unix, the, the oh. Unix guys yeah, didn't like. It's pretty fast though. The way that the, the vendors. If you do, oh, last thing about FCF. The MIT guys. Yeah. Last thing about FCF, it's streaming, so you can do like FD or find. And it doesn't need to finish before the output gets piped and is usable in FCF. Mm -hmm. So that's why. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It, and it tells you how many. Yeah, it's like how matches. many there are and how many I still need to look through. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so I, somehow I have six hundred and eighty thousand files that match 
Regina, which I was thinking it'd be more like totally 200. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, I mean, it is going to be fine. So that's, any, that's all files that, that anywhere in the path include the letters R, E, Yeah, and you I, can do a uh, caret in the front, in the front and it will in, have to in include order, Regina. If you want, if you wanted to match exactly, you can do an apostrophe, and then is it a posh? Okay, oh, it is a posh. Yeah, yeah. Single yeah. Take. yeah, but not like the back tick, just like the back tick. Okay, single that quote. That makes more sense. A hundred and twenty-one MP3s matching Regina was what I was expecting. About, there you go. About eight hundred and sixty thousand. Yeah, because those are using edit distance. It has to be in that order, but with anything in between. Anything in between. Interesting. Okay. What was we were on? Oh, Hex. I don't do enough of this, but it's so cool that I thought worth mention, mentioning. Um, it does Hex dumps, but with colorized Wait, what? output. <laughs> Why are you coloring? <laughs> the spaces. So okay. all oh, space, cool. not white space. Okay. What, oh, are, like, why special, are, what are the special, special characters? Oh, okay. So oh, and then like, like ASCII characters are one color. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm sure like, some of them are like. For all of them are white like space. Okay. That's cool. Are the red ones? Are the red ones like weird things like? Cool. Huh? I wish I knew about that before because I so used X. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. This is not great. That's like if you're ever reverse engineering the yeah. wire protocol, <laughs> you if if you if, if you, you, you need to do a hex dump, or this is dumps. yeah, this is awesome. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! This is, <laughs> All of this is what they get too excited. I know. <laughs> what was no, that? No, because because I have done extensive work where I'm comparing hexadecimal <laughs> because I'm, and like I started to learn the ASCII alphabet. In hex. Yeah, and you're like, oh, okay, okay. It's above. I don't remember right now, but it's like you know, it's it's above this number. It's below that number. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Oh, wait, this one looks wrong. Let me go figure out what that character is. Oh, it's just a slash. Okay. Yeah, we. Yeah. I remember we did like a couple labs in one class that I did that we had to do <coughs> attacks in hex in hex like in and um, assembly and stuff. It was fun. Bomb lab. The bomb lab. Yep, that's what it was. <laughs> Yeah, so this is cargo installed? <laughs> yes. Yeah. What? Cargo installed. Um, this one might be a. Yeah. It's definitely cargo install, but. HX. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, because I did brew install HX and it did not. Didn't it, find it didn't find it. So yeah, that that one I just think is really cool. So. Oh, that's awesome. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna end up using that. And then. Toshi, so my startup that I'm working with uses Elasticsearch. <coughs> Elasticsearch is awesome, feature rich, but is a huge resource hog because it's written in Java, among other things. It's super annoying to set up. It's, it's just a very big love-hate relationship <laughs> with Elasticsearch. This is, there's a project, so I don't know how much you guys know about Elasticsearch, but Elasticsearch is built on Apache Lucene, which is just a indexer of documents. Um, Toshi is to Elasticsearch as Tantiv is to Lucene. So Tantiv is the actual guts of Toshi. Um, and it is way faster than Elasticsearch and uses megabytes of RAM instead of get many gigabytes of RAM. And it's fast enough to start up in order to use it as like a command line. Elasticsearch takes like on my machine, which is pretty beefy, it takes like a good 30 seconds to start up. This takes 30 milliseconds to start up. So Toshi's really cool. Um, we at my startup, are following it, and when it becomes feature rich and production ready, we will definitely s switch to it. But al already out of the box, it does a, a good subset of Elasticsearch, like regex query and fuzzy, fuzzy querying and stuff. So that one's cool. So are there any SQL databases that are written in Rust? No. Not that I know of. 
I know. I know t- there's tick V, which is a key value, and titanium DB, tie DB. I don't know. That one's a call or I think it's a column base. It's like a hybrid SQLish something. So I keep waiting for a cross-platform database to exist. One that Postgres is pretty good. Uh, I don't know about Windows. That's my big caveat. Well, I think it works on Windows. On Windows. <laughs> yeah, I something, think it works. Something great. that's just like self-contained and like a person could reasonably compile from source if they needed to. I think you're white. SQLite. Well, <laughs> it's but it's, it doesn't it's scale horizontally. Not, and it, it SQLite is really really awesome for a lot of things, but it is still a pain to get installed on different or to to build on different platforms and. It has some limitations. Yeah, I, I briefly uh, contributed to an open source C++ thing that ran on Windows and Linux at least and used SQLite for its data storage. Um, it pain, but it worked. What about your um, Go, uh, what is the Go library, uh, Cockroach? I think it's just... Postgres with networking tools built in Go. It, it uses the Postgres um, wire format, but I think I, I think it actually is Postgres. I, I mean, thought it was pure Go. I don't think it's written in Go. I, I think, I think I think that it's basically some utilities. No, in Go around. Well, I'm going to ch- check. Again. I have I have a huge Go nerd. Have you heard of Caddy, the web server? Yeah, Matt. Yeah, Matt Holtz, one of my really good friends, and he was like pitching cockroach, cockroach, cockroach. To me, <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to hear him pitch it to me because I didn't quite understand it. To me, I just like I went through the, I read some stuff and it was like marketing, marketing, marketing. It's like okay, so this is for enterprises, <laughs> got it. And, <laughs> and then I tried to figure out like what it actually is. And I, it as just, far I, I as far as I'm Postgres. as far as I'm aware, it uses the Postgres wire, wire format p- protocol. So that you can use like PSQL um, and like Postgres clients w- against a cockroach cluster. That that was my understanding, and the, and the cockroach cluster was written in pure Go. It, no, it's absolutely not because in there, and I'm just I'm on their GitHub right now, and it's not pure Go. Cockroach C Debs Libroach. I'm I'm a, if it says. C depths, I'm assuming yeah. that's dependency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See. So then Lib Roach, that's obviously something that they wrote for cockroach. Yeah. And it's just a bunch of C plus plus. Huh. Well then, I guess your only hope for a But the good news is it compiles with C Lang that should be available for Windows as well, maybe. Is that how you, I always said clang. It's I've heard both ways. I I feel like both people pronounce it clang, but it is C. It is C Lang, yeah. Huh. But I, I would not have heard talk about it, and I've posted a podcast. They all call it Clang. That's know. like Etsy. Actually, I got down and talked about Clang. I, I, thought it, I thought it was C Lang because it's a C, C language, language compiler, compiler, yeah. I don't know. I, I think Clang sounds better. I, I pronounced sure. t- Tokyo I, wrong, and then I asked on Reddit how to pronounce it. And they're <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure it's Tokyo. Um, so uh, that, that, well, that, that, that would be acceptable. I mean, because I, I thought it was talk IO because it's an IO library. Um, yeah. But I was wrong. Two hits, sir. Um, so one of the things that Cockroach uses is Rocks DB. Oh, yeah. is that how they're doing it? That's so. Isn't that the Facebook thing? Is that Facebook? Yeah. <coughs> so it's it's like the that's the key value store that's like the rock the, the index, right? yeah. Which is a fork of level DB. Yeah. Which is a fork. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Toke, or however you say it, we talked about briefly, it counts lines, source code lines, which is a more complicated problem than I thought. Now, why do you, why would any, I've you never, made a draft for it. I, just for fun. I've never heard of this. I mean, I've heard jokes about people saying like a manager, blah, 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 but I've never actually heard of someone. I, like honestly, line, line kind of code. The, honestly, I was just bored one day and counted my, we were, I wrote a backend in Node, 
switched from Postgres to Elasticsearch and then rewrote the backend in Rust. And I was just super curious how things compared. And so I installed Toke and I, I think it's mostly it's just for, for fun. information purposes. So yeah. you get a code base and want to see what's in it. Yeah. Oh, there's some Python script in there. And there's I mean, imagine like the GitHub little summary thing, right? Yeah, like building that. They, you want to they should put another column in there that's like the scary percent column. And, and it should do like a calculation of uh, comment lines to code lines. Yeah, or like unsafe in Rust or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think there's Cargo Geiger, 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 a Geiger, yeah. Which which does that. So actually, actually, I might use this too because sometimes um, I like to do stupid things that I hate, but that, you know, sound cool. like say how few lines of code a library is yes. in order to say that it's under 100 lines i have to check without the comments and you could do you could do that uh, you know for wasm stuff because that actually matters in the browser see how many lines or bytes or whatever your wasm library compiled to or your pure javascript library if heaven forbid you have to write javascript um oh and then the xi editor i mentioned briefly this is probably, well, besides Toshi and Tantavi, probably the most ambitious project on here. Yeah, it's it's uh, started by a guy who was at Google. Yes. He was also involved in the Fuchsia project. He, was, he did Fuchsia and he did their font, yeah. their font stuff. His name is Rafe, or Rafe Levine. Rafe Levine, yeah. yeah. They did a lot somehow. Yeah, so he's, yeah, he's really cool. He does, he does Xi, um, and he's actually stepped back a little bit from Xi because he's interested in Druid, which is a cross-platform GUI library that Xi uses. So wait, wait what is Xi? Xi is a modern editor that is actually fast written. Imagine like the, all the like, the mentality of like VI and Emacs, but written with modern tools and it's gonna be fast. And it's um, a- what it's a client server. So, so it's a client server. So the server, so it's like Neo them in that it's client server. Great with GUI stuff. And but they have like a first class Mac GUI for it. They have a command line GUI for it. They have a Go command line GUI for it. They have, you know, all of all of these GUIs. An Electron GUI for it, for people who. Like the idea to, is to torture have a themselves. Really powerful, you know, sort of GUI agnostic engine, uh -huh. and uh, to have like the native best uh, GUI for whatever platform you need. And I, I watched this. I've installed it a few times to just follow its progress. Um, I'm really into the. Why am I blanking on the name? Probably because it's late. Um, the there's Microsoft um, language server L LSP language server protocol that they've had a long standing issue open to add that to Xi, and I think once it gets that, um, I might see if I could how how far I could get as a daily driver. <coughs> and they have a cool plugin architecture as well. It's all just through a JSON or RPC. So yeah, that's Zai. I, I say it's not ready for production use, but definitely keep an eye on that one. We already talked about Skim, FCF. Should we talk about JQ? It's written in C. No. JQ is really cool. JQ is awesome. You should, have, you should use it. It's a full functional programming language if you get into it. It lets you do, you can also just do like that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's sick. It, it's um, like anything that needs to munge uh, JSON files. I use it. Files. Yeah. I actually used it to take the output of an Elasticsearch dump, format it for a bulk upload, and then upload my database again. Yeah. With, with like I mean, millions stuff of records. I do work, all the fields in the JSON files, and it's like intermediate format. So, so, yeah. 
Yeah. Boom. And then you have a microservice right there. <laughs> So yeah, it's easy to do uh, like the, the basic, you know, get this nested field out, out of every record. Yeah. But uh, it ramps up nicely in power to do just about anything. Yeah. I found that I often just get kind of annoyed and just use Python or Rust or something to parse it past like yeah. map and filter it, and stuff. You have to be in the functional programming yeah. mindset to really And you have to know far. exactly how it likes it. But it's awesome. Cargo edit. So there you go. Yes. <laughs> so those are all of my general toolbox. And then these last couple are Rust specific. Um, these are cargo subcommands. Um, cargo edit, I don't know if you guys have heard of this one. It basically just adds cargo add, cargo remove, and cargo upgrade, which modifies your cargo.toml file with what you'd expect it to. So you just cargo add a, a file, I mean a dependency. Instead of editing. Yeah, so it's it's kind of similar to what NPM has, but I think if I had to guess, if I was a betting man, it would the cargo people are going to add it to cargo proper once they've kind of figured out some rough edges of of cargo edit. Cargo watch, I already briefly told you about. Basically, I just run cargo watch. Um, basically this is, this is kind of the one that I want, I run the most. So anytime you edit a source file, it just reloads, it reruns a command. So I use it to keep my server running. Cargo tree is really cool. And I actually submitted a pull request a couple months ago that is sitting. Let's see how long it's been sitting there. Hmm. Since the end of September to add a depth option, but it's basic, oops, it's a tree visualizer of your dependencies. Oh, cool. The thing that I use it most for, mostly for is it, you can do a pass a D option and it sh only shows the duplicates. Mm -hmm. And then I can- You can figure out which ones you're yeah. falling behind on or something yeah. to update or whatever. Get mad at the four different versions of regex and the three <laughs> different versions of sin and- the class. Every, yeah, I have a, the project in my server that I'm working on has like 300, I think, trend in total dependencies. And it takes like a couple of minutes to compile. I was like, hey, at least we have some criminal compilation now. Oh, yeah. So, I I had to help my friend do some make and CMake junk today. And I'm like, uh -oh. Cargo, you are amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, Cargo Tree is awesome. It, you know, this it has like, you know, depth limiting, well, I added that, and you can do duplicates, you can do oh, uh, show this node in the tree and its dependencies and like, you know, inverse dependencies. This last one is the, the kind of oddball, but I've found it super useful. Um, I use it, it's a Docker image that you can use to build, um, cross-platform yeah. Docker images. There's a bunch of them. This is the one that I found to be the easiest and most feature rich. It has like OpenSSL and a couple other like C libraries that a lot of things depend on. And at the end of the day, I take this and then I can do a from scratch run my binary. And because it's uh, statically linked, everything, you know, works. And so, yeah, my I, I do uh, static console. Yeah, it's awesome. So that you can install on any distro. You don't have to worry about what version of Linux you install. It's awesome. And I can, I can do it in the Google Cloud. I can do it on any Linux machine. Um, and my Docker image is like 20 megabytes. 
which is just my binary, which is crazy that it's 20 megabytes, but. <laughs> You have all your debugging tools. No, and that's stripped. It's like 60 megabytes. I think I think it's actually like seven, 17 or 18 now. But yeah, I stripped everything. And that isn't with, opt, that's optimized for speed, not for size. For size, it was like 12, but I didn't think it was worth that. Um, I personally would love to see Rust not have to rely on Muscle C to do static things. I wish that it just had a straight kernel interface, but that is way too much work for way, or for not enough uh, gains. Yeah. I think in five years it might be worth doing that, but Rust has bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Well, muscle is not that heavy. Of a no, it's not it heavy. Doesn't, it doesn't do a whole lot aside from just. It makes cr it makes cross compiling annoying because you have to install the muscle tool chain to yeah. cross compile. So I created a while back. Because I thought that uh, the, the default way of doing it was not working right. I, I did like a multi-stage Docker builder. Yeah, I have that. It's if anyone wants that, I could take out some company-specific stuff and share it with you. But it's like bit scaffold out a project, build the dependencies, then build my Docker, my actual thing, and then do another multi-stage to just run my scratch because Docker or Cargo really needs a to build dependencies only flag. Hmm. And there's a GitHub, they, that, no, they no, don't no. have it. And there's, talking about it though, right? they've had an issue open for like two years that I'm following on GitHub. But honestly, I think Rust is just, it's a cool project. It's just, there's so, there's so much lot to do. Lot to do. But that's there. There was something that I just added recently where it, it's like it, it was just for it. It, it um, this thing was like offline, like even like so it can offline. download stuff, which is a huge step. Uh -huh. But it doesn't build them. Okay. And my dependencies take on my machine a minute, and on the cloud builder that we use, it takes thirty minutes to build oh, our gosh. thing. <laughs> so it's like, wow. Sorry, that's in release mode. It's like 15 in debug mode. And also it has link time optimization, which adds like 10 minutes. But I say, hey, why not spend an extra 10 minutes build time so that users can see fast results? Have you measured any actual improvement? <laughs> <laughs> no, mostly because it's not in production yet, but I, I'm hoping that it's there. But hey, I mean, if... Yeah, if, I've, I've seen link time optimization improvements in some C projects. And yeah, I, I, and the only reason I'm doing it is because there's a couple C dependencies that I know that it would... And there's a whole bunch of uh, Rust crates that are duplicated and stuff that it, it would hopefully optimize out. So yeah, that's it. Any any questions or? No, that was really cool walk through yeah, all cool. that stuff. I had no idea of most of those things existed. And now I have no age old stuff. Um, that being said, there is a, I don't know if you guys know the Rust Awesome. Have you guys heard of like it's Awesome just, thing? Yeah. It's too long. <laughs> it's too long. So <laughs> most of these are on there. Actually, one of them is not. But this is like a cherry pick version of Probably that. Probably. Yeah, yeah. The go one's not on there. So that's it.